everyone. This is Jerry DiMaggio. I'll be serving as your moderator for today's ARA webinar Wednesday program, Pave Trail Management for Cyclists and Pedestrians. We're most fortunate today. We have two of our outstanding pavement specialists, and also within ARA, they're well known as cycling enthusiasts. So I'll be giving you some introductory information and then joining you later for the Q&A program. Next slide, please. So just a few housekeeping items. Uh, if it's an issue with the webinar and you're joining by computer speakers, use your telephone to call in. If you're still experiencing problems, you can see highlighted in slide number two. By the way, you see the slide numbers in the lower right-hand corner of this slide deck. Please just send a message to the host and we'll do our very best to help you out. Next slide, please. We encourage you to ask questions throughout the program. Today's program is 60 minutes in length. Following my introduction, we'll have about a 40 to 45 minute presentation and then about a 15 minute Q&A program. Uh, often we find that people kind of wait to the last minute to ask questions, but we encourage you to submit your questions during the entire program. Again, if you refer to the Q&A box in the screen that you see on slide number three, we'll defer answering all questions until the conclusion of the technical program. Next slide, please. To see the presentation in full screen, um, you can see highlighted in slide four, go to the uh, manage the panels, look at view and click on view screen. Next slide, please. Now I'd like to introduce our speakers, but uh, I was remiss one thing before I introduce our two pavement specialists. Often asked questions, and we'll repeat this at the conclusion of the program. Uh, a PDF version of today's presentation will be available for download. We'll also be providing PDH one hour credit for those of you who join the program for the entire period. And then I'll be speaking about availability recordings for all of our previous programs. This is the two year anniversary of the monthly ARA webinar Wednesday program. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce one of our, both of our speakers, Mr. Mike Harrell, who comes from our champaign Urbana office. As I mentioned previously, Mike is a principal pavement engineer. He's a group leader within the consulting group. He has several decades of experience and he's a professional engineer in Illinois, Indiana and Colorado. Next slide, please. Joining Mike today is Alex Eva. Alex is from ARA's Toronto, Canada office. He has advanced degrees also in pavements, uh, McMaster's University and the University of Waterloo. Has a broad range of experience. Again, uh, even though he's joined ARA only uh, less than a decade ago, he has quite a bit of experience he'll be sharing with you today. Alex will be uh, beginning today's verbal presentation. I'll be joining you again at the conclusion, as I mentioned before, for further information. Alex. Thanks, Jerry. So here's the trail map today, today's presentation. So we'll talk a little bit about what the benefits are of actively managing the trails that, uh, that we have as part of our networks, a little bit of the the basics of asset management and how they apply here, but also some of the challenges that trails uh, introduce compared to more traditional highway and road infrastructure. We'll talk about a little bit about the data collection tools that are available for trails and paths. And then we'll talk about two case studies. These are two projects that ARA has participated in, uh, both comprising trail networks, and we'll sort of wrap it up there. So with the Declaration of the COVID pandemic, uh, all of our lives have been turned upside down. And with the introduction of uh, many stay-at-home orders last year, people have had to change their habits. And uh, with the restrictions on gatherings that have been introduced, people have had to um, find other ways to uh, get outside. So exercise and social interaction may have often come at the gym or the fitness center, but now we've had to find, uh, find other ways, and these people have been pushed outdoors. Uh, 
and others who are just uh, looking to get out of the house after being cooped up for months at a time, just uh, want to get out for a walk or a cycle. And uh, this has sort of brought, to, brought attention to our trail networks and their importance. Uh, many jurisdictions have seen uh, dramatic increases in the use of their facilities. Uh, back in March, uh, the Rail to Trails Conservancy found that a uh, nationwide uh, increase of about 200% in that same week compared to 2019. And, uh, you know, some of that may not be entirely uh, pandemic related, but there is no uh, doubt that trail usage has gone up and probably will remain up for the next year or so. So why should we manage our trails? Well, the reality is, is that paved trail users enjoy paved trails in better condition more. Uh, when uh, there are fewer bumps or fewer hazards that may result in tripping, they uh, encourage further use. Uh, smoother trails provide smoother ride for real users. And uh, user satisfaction is a key component of uh, people's uh, what people choose to do for their outdoor recreation activities. So, and all of this um, creates a more positive impression of the agency that manages the trail. And public perception can drive up more demand and therefore support the continued funding and improvement of our facilities. So, and, uh, you know, with the invention of, um, you know, wheelchair equipped bicycles like the duet here shown on the screen, uh, this sort of provides opportunities for a greater portion of the populace to get outside, all of which, all of which encourages increased use. But the question here is, is what is the advantages to the agencies? Well, bike paths and other trails that encourage and support active transportation are an important and valuable component of our municipal infrastructure, just like roads and water mains. And consequently, you know, they warrant the same level of attention. Our trails promote activity uh, and wellness by providing separation from motor vehicles and provide a unique way of enjoying parks and forests by allowing us to travel within them rather than around them. More and more facilities are seeing users use these facilities for commuting in addition to recreation. And um, the users of these facilities expect them to be in a uh, well-maintained condition, uh, capable of supporting all different modes of usage, such as walking, cycling, rollerblading, etc. Each of these methods of, uh, or modes of usage provide unique challenges to the individuals responsible for maintaining the trails. For example, uh, a faulted transverse crack in a pathway may not be a big deal for pedestrians, but for a rollerblader, this might uh, result in serious injury when uh, crossing this crack and tripping at high speed. So what do we do now? Well, the reality is it really depends. Many organizations are reactive, planning their maintenance activities around complaints received. Others patrol their facilities more frequently. But again, without any sort of systematic approach there, this usually results in a worse first approach to trail management, in which the trail sections in the poorest condition that is the most deteriorated are repaired first. If, uh, if adequate funding is available, then the roughest and most cracked sections will get fixed. But the reality is, is that this isn't usually the most cost-effective method of budgeting limited funds, which we know is always the case. So we need to know what we have, know what we need, and we, with, an, uh, with a systematic asset management plan, we can get there. So um, trail and path management follow similar principles to those used in any kind of municipal permit management approach. Uh, an agency needs to inventory the assets, that is knowing what paths and trails they have, and uh, in the best case scenarios, they have done in a geo-referenced way. And we can divide these into segments not, um, based on the previous construction limits, uh, natural boundaries or intersections, uh, size or length, jurisdictional boundaries, and other uh, criteria. And at that point, once we know what we have, we need to know what condition it is. So using, uh, using one of the many methodologies that exists, we can uh, assess them for uh, roughness and cracking and other things like that. And, uh, but also there are other criteria that will, uh, can be assessed such as their 
compliance with accessibility requirements that I'll touch upon a little bit later. And um, while, while street-based condition methods often use or can use such a uh, you know, vehicle-based multifunction um, digital survey vehicles with various sensors to collect these, this data, those aren't always compatible uh, with trail networks, seeing as you know we oftentimes don't have 12 foot lane or 12 foot wide paths. So uh, sometimes a little bit um, more uh, unique or more um, or special data collection methods can be used, and we'll get into a little that a little bit further into that soon. So uh, once we know what condition our network is, we can identify the needs. We need to want to know where we are, where we can get to. In using uh, this data, we can prioritize the treatments, not only the type of treatment, but also the section that requires treatment. And overall, by doing this in a iterative and systematic manner, we're able to optimize the number condition, oftentimes seeing improvement in overall score or average score. And this, um, all this results in is a better, better user experience. So some general Med benefits of asset management. Well, uh, here's an example of a payment date deterioration curve that can get put together with a couple, um, couple of rounds of data collection. Uh, oftentimes, it sort of starts uh, starts pretty slow, pretty fast. Sorry, and it uh, continues um, pretty uh, on a sort of gradual level. Uh, that becomes a point where the payment condition starts to decrease rapidly. And this is sort of the critical PCI here, where uh, before that point, we can apply various preventative maintenance treatments, uh, usually for a low unit cost. But then after we cross this uh, critical point here, uh, we're stuck with resorting to more expensive uh, major rehabilitation or reconstruction alternatives, which may cost uh, four to five times more than the preventative maintenance here, or you know, up to 10, 12, maybe 15 times um, once we get to the major rehab or reconstruction point here. So, by uh, applying the principles of asset management, we're able to develop uh, this kind of curve so we can predict future condition, knowing uh, sort of what we have and where we'll be. We can establish our funding needs. And then, uh, using all of this data, we can identify the most cost effective strategies. To maintain or improve our system um, system condition. So generally, uh, when we talk about payment management, we're generally talking about payment evaluation. There is more to it, such as accessibility, as I mentioned, but uh, generally we re revolve around the payment conditions. So here's a couple examples of payments in various conditions. Generally, we apply some kind of um, some kind of payment evaluation methodology, such as the uh, ASTM standard P6433, standard method for payment condition surveys for roads and parking lots, in order to develop a um, payment condition index, which is representative of the overall condition of the uh, of the trail segment. This factors in the distress type, the distress extent, and the distress severity. And to put it out of a score out of 100, where 100 is excellent or you know brand new, and zero is completely failed. So, um, as an example, here's a pavement in excellent condition, been recently paved. This is something maybe in a few years we'd consider some kind of routine maintenance, such as crack sealing. Here's a pavement in generally good condition. We've seen some cracking starting to develop here. So this is something maybe some a treatment such as a Story seal might be uh, beneficial to, as a preventative treatment to extend life here. Here's a fair example where we're saying starting to see more, uh, more pre prevalent cracking. And here's a poor example where this payment is uh, is uh, approaching the uh, approaching the classification of failed. And then once we get to this point, we're generally uh, the only option would be to fully replace the asphalt in this section here. So. Just a few examples here for you. And now I will turn it over to Mike, who will introduce uh, some of the trail collection tools that we have available for us for trails. All right. Thank you, Alex. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, pleased to be presenting and talking with you today. 
I'm going to jump right into some of the data collection tools that uh, are available for assessing uh, trails and uh, providing you with valuable data for making decisions uh, as you manage your assets. Um, those can include uh, either bicycle or tricycle based, you know, vehicle based uh, data collection tools. Uh, there's also foot on ground uh, survey methods uh, that are certainly applicable. Uh, including what you can see in the picture here with Joan is uh, using a tablet application to uh, record uh, conditions of, of, the, uh, of the trail. And you know, to that end, there are uh, tablet or smartphone applications as well as a traditional uh, paper and pencil and uh, options for recording. Um, for bicycle and pedestrian paths, foot on ground surveys can work to inventory and assess those path conditions um, foot on ground surveys can allow for more detailed surveys, but they're definitely more time consuming uh, and uh, certainly less productive on a you know, mileage basis uh, per day. More agencies are not moving to vehicle based data collection for paths uh, and so the condition of paved paths are more critical for wheeled transport like bicycles or wheelchairs, uh, especially when the speeds are considered. Potential for injuries does go up dramatically with, uh, with the increase in speed. Um, so vehicle-based data collection more closely emulates real use conditions from those real users. Now let's move to the next slide. Here's a couple of examples of uh, real uh, data collection uh, uh, tools for paved trails. Uh, there's Definitely, you know, you know, many ways to collect data on these trails uh, with, you know, bicycles or tricycles, push behind buggy devices. Uh, those tools uh, can include cameras and GPS antenna for georeferencing data that is collected. Data can be linked to an agency's GIS shape files or other form of geodatabase to help an agency know where those trail conditions might be good and where they may need attention. Uh, examples like the uh, lower left-hand side, the Iowa Data Bike, uh, created by the Des Moines Area Metropolitan Planning Organization, uh, can be assembled with several COTS parts to get a data collection vehicle. Uh, others include beneficial designs, high efficiency trail assessment process, or the HETAP buggy, uh, shown in the top right of this slide. Uh, those both vehicles are outfitted with cameras, uh, GPS antenna, and accelerometers for the smoothness measurement and bump identification on the trail. Next slide. Um, one of the examples of uh, trail management uh, tools in terms of software is, uh, is an example here called Rubix. It's a suite of infrastructure management tools uh, developed by uh, Rival Solutions, a Canadian company. Uh, they include mobile data collection applications, uh, cloud-based data processing and storage, as well as web-based data uh, dashboard for data mapping visualization and reporting. Um, Rubik's Suite is a flexible cloud-based technology platform, allows users efficiently gather information about the condition of infrastructure features, including roads, sidewalks, uh, parking lots, and, and more. Um, further, they can use a basic rule-based decision uh, methodology. Uh, they can customize business, uh, the results to match business practices and the decision needs related to various infrastructure. Um, uh, part of the components of the Rubik suite include data collection, data processing, the, the dashboard for um, observing and, and, uh, and picturing the data, as well as analytics for um, creating your decision matrices for uh, asset management. And then uh, they actually offer an image viewing component as well. So if you capture data or images uh, with a variety of different cameras, they can be viewed uh, similar uh, to a Google product uh, through their same dashboard. Next slide. Uh, here's an example of one of the particular applications from Rubix. It's called our Rough. Uh, it's, a, it's their smartphone application. Uh, it uses the smartphone accelerometer to measure roughness specifically for trails by uh, uh, attached to a bicycle uh, and it can record user-defined events uh, and images within the application. 
Um, the Iowa data bike was outfitted with the R rough trail roughness measurement application. Um, the, the application reported the measurements of the smartphone's accelerometer, the phone's GPS uh, position measurement, and images in real time as the phone traverses the trail attached to the bicycle. The accelerometer data was resolved to report bump and sag events corresponding to significant accelerations. Those are really important. And then it's also resolved to report overall trail condition index by averaging the roughness measurement over predefined segments of the trail. This is another opportunity or uh, another option for an overall condition index rather than a specific counting of cracks methodology uh, that you can utilize a roughness uh, estimation uh, to represent your section conditions. Next slide. Another example of a data collection tool is a field inspector. This is a, the inspection interface extension of PAVER, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers Pavement Management System software. A field inspector is installed on a tablet and enables a surveyor to perform pavement condition surveys in the field with identification of sample units and direct data entry formatted specifically for the paper database. Um, the nice thing about the uh, field inspector tool is it provides the survey interface as well as a geodatabase viewer and editor. So that surveyor can actually edit and revise the segment of trail asset in the field as inspections are being performed. So it's not just a recording of conditions, but actually manipulation of the geodatabase in real time uh, if you need to make changes for whatever reason uh, trails were uh, realigned or uh, such segments were uh, redefined uh, between uh, visits for condition surveys you can make those updates uh, with this tool in the field pretty handy next slide uh, another uh, example is the R inspector tool. Again, back to the Rubik's suite of uh, tools. Um, R inspector allows the surveyor to perform condition surveys uh, in accordance with required condition assessment methodology. You can program it for PACER, uh, the PCI procedure, uh, or any number of other uh, methodologies that you may desire for measuring more specific trail conditions. Uh, not every trail management agency subscribes to the same pavement condition methodology for reporting reporting uh, distresses or conditions uh, so this tool can be used to uh, to match with the business practice of that particular agency our inspector allows the surveyor to capture photographs of defects or items of interest and attach those as georeference photos to the inspection form in the database so that's another pretty handy tool. It's a tablet-based application, uh, pretty lightweight and uh, very responsive. Um, works pretty well. Uh, next slide. So now that we've talked about several of the tools available for uh, data collection means, uh, we're going to uh, jump into the first of our two case studies uh, to kind of demonstrate some of the practice of uh, the uh, putting these tools into practice. Uh, directions that these uh, agencies have chosen to go with uh, the management of their trail assets. Um, the first one we'll talk about is a forest preserve district of Cook County. Uh, this is the county that includes uh, Chicago uh, in Illinois in the United States. Um, they received a grant from the Illinois Department of Transportation's statewide planning and research program, SPMR, uh, to evaluate paved trail condition evaluation technologies along with user counters, speed measurement sensors, and implementing a pavement management system. The project also includes the evaluation, selection, and deployment of mobile inventory and asset assessment applications using current handheld mobile technology. So a pretty comprehensive scope uh, of uh, option of uh, items to accomplish for uh, the Forest Preserve They've got uh, 150 uh, miles of paved trails, so a pretty significant network uh, spanning the county. So uh, they have uh, some pretty hefty needs, and uh, we were, uh, we're pleased to be uh, walking down the path, so to speak, with them. Uh, let's go to the next slide. 
So the first example of a sensor uh, solution that uh, has been determined, um, there were several speed measurement sensors available uh, in, uh, in the market and Forest Preserve selected the SDR bike sensor to measure user speeds. Um, user speeds are an important safety consideration for paved trails. Uh, as we were discussing previously, uh, if users have too high of speed or too large of differential of speeds between users, there are certainly opportunities for crashes uh, either between users or deviations from the trail pavement, leading to sometimes severe injuries. Uh, like many agencies with paved trails, the Forest Preserve has a few locations on the network where smooth, flat trails lend themselves to high speed cycling, and some accidents have been observed. The SDR bike sensor is a radar-based sensor that can be affixed on a number of supports in a remote environment. The sensor is actually pictured here on the slide, uh, attached to a sign uh, support. Uh, it can actually be attached even to a tree uh, or other um, very discrete uh, locations alongside of a trail uh, to you know, minimize the impact of the sensor and really help to not bias the users either, you know, approaching the sensor either quickly because they see that it's there and want to show off a little bit or slowing down thinking that they're being watched for whatever reason. It's a great uh, discrete sensor to deploy. Um, the sensor has a battery life that lasts up to two weeks um, and the sensor is easily set up using a smart phone or device application and data can be uploaded to the cloud automatically. Uh, this was, uh, has already uh, brought, uh, provided some very valuable data for uh, the Cook County Forest Preserve District uh, and is allowing them to capture the speed-related data that they're looking for and help them understand how they can better serve their user base. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, this is an example of the data collection bicycle that the Forest Preserve uh, chose to, to uh, deploy. Um, so recall from the previous slides, the Iowa data bike uh, was in, is an e-assist bike, uh, but it was a much larger frame. Uh, it's actually a cargo-based uh, bicycle. Uh, the Forest Preserve District uh, chose to go with the Trek uh, Berg Plus 2 uh, low-step e-bike. Uh, so a, a smaller platform and the low step allows for more accessibility between different users that might uh, use that bike for data collection efforts on the trails. Uh, that bike is outfitted with a, a GoPro Hero 7 Black camera uh, to uh, capture the trail surface imagery uh, there on the back end of the, of the bike. Uh, off screen up at the top of the mast is a GoPro Max 360 camera. Uh, which would be in the vicinity of <laughs> where the mouse is being circled. Um, that 360 camera captures uh, exactly what it says, a 360 degree imagery uh, and kind of a Google Street View style uh, viewing uh, opportunity for trails. Um, the bike was also outfitted with a smartphone with the RRUF measurement application, uh, as well as an external battery pack for powering uh, all of the peripherals that attached to the bike. Uh, next slide. So using the RRUF application and the smartphone, uh, the data was actually collected with the e-bike uh, during the course of 2020 on all 150 plus miles of trails uh, that are managed by the Forest Preserve. And uh, the, the roughness was measured with that RRUF app uh, on all of those trails. And actually all the trails were traversed in both directions of travel. So uh, most trails are in the, between six and eight feet wide. Uh, so it was important to get, uh, gather the roughness measurement in traditional directions of travel. Um, so those uh, passes were made in both directions uh, on all the trails. And that will be done actually again in 2021. So we'll start to have a little bit of a, a paving condition uh, curve uh, associated with the roughness and the, um, the development of the trail condition, trail roughness condition, uh, which comes from the R rough application. So what we're seeing on screen right now is a screen capture of the R dash dashboard, uh, which shows the 
uh, the roughness application and uh, the you can see actually some of the segments that were measured uh, and their approximate color coded bins that represent uh, typically good, fair, or poor uh, roughness measurements associated with the, uh, the application. Next slide. Um, one of the next tools that was selected is the uh, was uh, to accomplish the project is uh, for mobile data collection um, and specifically looking at uh, you know more of typically point based asset uh, inventory and survey um, and the Forest Preserve District selected the uh, ESRI or Esri Survey One Two Three application. Uh, it's a customizable survey uh, and inventory platform. Uh, does allow photographs to be attached to surveys. Um, and as I mentioned, it's looking for kind of more of the point-based assets uh, along trails that are complementary to the trail uh, network, um, including drainage culverts, uh, security fences, uh, access gates, uh, railings, and, and, and other assets. Um, Cook County is a full ERSR, ESRI GIS license holder, so the Survey 123 application actually cost them nothing uh, to access because they already had uh, access to the, the uh, ESRI uh, suite. Um, and the team developed the survey screens for identifying the asset conditions along those trails, and uh, the survey results and photographs are geo-referenced and aligned with the county's GIS. Survey will be taking off uh, this in, in 2021 to actually utilize this tool uh, to capture those uh, specific items. With that, um, I'm going to turn it back over to Alex. That was the kind of the super wrap up on the Forest Preserve for County. Uh, now Alex is going to come back and talk about his experience with the city of Mississauga. Alex, take away. Thanks, Mike. So I'd like to introduce to you all another project that ARA performed for a Canadian municipality for the paved trail evaluation. This was done in 2020. So um, Mississauga is a large city in the greater Toronto area with about uh, 400 kilometers, 240 miles of uh, trails under management. And uh, sort of introduce, uh, given the uh, RFP requirements that they put out, I'll sort of walk you through what we did here. Uh, we also chose to implement the um, the, uh, the Rubik system um, and the associate apps because the uh, city requested a pavement service condition assessment using um, which we proposed to do using the interior ministry transportation methods. Uh, they also requested objective roughness surveys and imagery collections. So the IRF application, as Mike described was well suited for all of this. And uh, just to keep all the data together, we found that implementing our inspector as well uh, for the uh, pavement condition evaluation proposed, uh, put together sort of a neat all-in-one solution for us. So uh, in order to um, assess the uh, pavement condition, um, we assess their asphalt and concrete pavements using the MTO manuals each of which has 15 uh, pavement specific type distresses rated at five severities and five extents. And uh, we supplied, uh, this was allowed us to supply a PCI for each segment. And the city also manages other pavement types. They had bricks, uh, brick pavers, uh, unpaved trails, gravel and dirt, and also some wooden boardwalks. For this, we didn't perform a, a sort of specific pavement evaluation, but we also, we did carry out a quick uh, safety hazard assessment um, just to ensure that everything was uh, uh, in good shape for the trail users. So uh, shown in the picture here is an example of the data collection screen for the iPad based R inspector application. We can see here uh, for an asphalt trail, some of the distresses that we were identified uh, rated at uh, here's the um, selected severity and the selected extent and also we were able to take sort of some uh, representative photos of the sections which were uh, geotagged to meet to identify those specific locations so uh, also some uh, geo uh, geometric um, parameters we did uh, confirm the trail trail width that uh, 
generally just to see that that matched what was already in the city's GIS database. And also um, further to that, we carried out the roughness surveys using the RF application on an iPhone. Here's an example. Here's a picture of our tricycle where we mounted a uh, rear facing mount here on the back uh, so that the uh, uh, the iPhone collecting the roughest information, but also the imagery, which the RF application is also capable of. Uh, so we took rear facing image high rear facing images at 10 meter or 30, approximately 33 foot intervals, uh, rear facing throughout the network so that the city would also get this sort of Google Street View style uh, uh, option to view their network uh, as it was at the time of data collection. So all in all, this um, this is sort of the effort that we undertook for them. One thing I want to highlight uh, that is sort of a, that we found to be a sort of a, a very valuable component of the Rubik system is the way that we could implement the quality control program within within the uh, within the software. So we use two levels of quality control here. One was sort of an automated input validation check where uh, the software itself would check for non-compliance of certain rules that we described. These rules would include, you know, if you selected a distress, you had to select both a severity and an extent. If you somehow forgot to include one of those, or the inspector forgot to include one of those, that would have gotten tagged for a review and correction. The second level was a desk and field audit where uh, uh, the uh, R dash application allowed us, the web dashboard allowed us, uh, our trained quality auditors, uh, pavement engineers to sort of view view the um, view the inspection and validate the distresses that were selected and entered and confirm that the calculated PCI was reasonable. And we also performed some field audits where um, just to see see that, uh, that the auditor who would actually go visit the segment would agree with the uh, calculated PCI and the distresses that led to that point. So, in the end, approximately 20% of the network was reviewed for, uh, for quality. Here's an example of the dashboard showing our final uh, disposition of uh, the quality program. So the uh, all the segments were originally highlighted in yellow, and the green ones here are the ones that have been reviewed. So we uh, this was performed somewhat systematically, somewhat randomly, just to sort of just to sort of you know, get an overall picture of the network and the work that was being done. And then, uh, as the um, as the reviewers reviewed the uh, data, they were able to see the pictures that were taken in the field, the stresses, and the PCI. And in the end, uh, we would review, accept, or refuse the inspection. If it was accepted, there was no other steps required. And if there was a refusal, then that would require either a correction of some input uh, in the uh, by the inspector, such as changing the uh, severity or extent of a distress. Changing the stress, perhaps uh, the auditor may have determined that uh, a call of uh, set, uh, you know edge cracking was better better represented by alligator edge cracking, something like that. So in the end, uh, once those were all corrected, then um, that was sort of resulted in our final data set here. So uh, as an example here on the bottom right, you can see sort of the uh, imagery collected by the iPhone, how that's available to these uh, blue dots here represents a photo that was taken. And then by clicking on the image button here, you could see that uh, that would pop up. And you could sort of see see what was uh, going on on the trail segment there. So another component of our um, of our assessment for the city here was uh, an assessment of the of some accessibility criteria. Uh, many agencies um, or jurisdictions have introduced accessibility standards, and these uh, standards consider the needs of individuals with different levels of ability and just making sure that the design and construction of public infrastructure uh, sort of allows uh, everybody to sort of use the, the facilities with limited uh, restrictions. So there are many benefits to doing this. Um, uh, it's sort of unfair to sort of exclude uh, member parts of our society. So as part of construction or as part of retrofit work or re reconstruction work, many agencies are uh, upgrading their, their facilities to implement uh, some additional 
accessible features, and I'll get to that how that applies to trails on the next slide here. So, as part of this, um, uh, we considered a number of criteria here. Uh, for us, uh, seeing as this was done in Ontario, the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act was sort of the uh, defining legislation here. And some of the technical criteria that we uh, that were evaluated on this project were longitudinal grades, but also cross slopes, surface type, trail widths, the presence of uh, horizontal obstructions or vertical obstructions, um, the provision of rest areas, so that uh, in this in this case that usually meant the bench uh, at regular intervals, so that the trail users could take a break if needed. Uh, compliant ramps, uh, not only meeting um, the grade requirements or having ramps at those uh, intersections where uh, you know level changes in elevation are present, but also you know the provision of um, uh, tactile walking surface indicators uh, to uh, help those with lower vision. And also the provision of signage um, such that uh, individuals uh, can navigate the system um, with ease. Uh, if there are some um, sections of trail that are less accessible, identifying those, etc., just so uh, no one runs into any sort of uncomfortable situations. So, uh, on the Mississauga project, we were able to put together a custom form. Uh, using in the R inspector application, where we would evaluate sort of on a on an acceptable uh, marginal unacceptable sort of type scale, uh, a number of criteria here shown in the uh, shown in the image here, and then uh, we were able to take also uh, photos, geotag photos of non-compliance, just so that uh, the uh, the agency would have uh, a record of these. Um, these locations and features that uh, uh, should be considered for upgrade in the future as uh, as uh, maintenance and rehabilitation and uh, reconstruction is being performed throughout the network. So, so you know, a couple uh, couple images here going forward of some uh, accessibility criteria that uh, you may want to consider as part of uh, when evaluating your trail networks uh, further to just the pavement conditions. So. Um, on the left here, we can see uh, a section of trail with some loose open graded gravel. This results in a uh, very loose surface that is almost inaccessible to any sort of wheeled users, such as cyclists or wheelchairs. Uh, there's nothing wrong with a, a gravel surface, uh, but a fine uh, hard pack limestone screening material is oftentimes will provide a better uh, hard pack surface that's accessible to almost everyone. Um, I think she said on the right here, we can see a trip hazard here at the interface the between uh, concrete and sidewalk and an asphalt there. trail. This kind of thing is oftentimes uh, inevitable, but it's uh, important uh, to sort of monitor the network, identify these locations, uh, tag them. This this lip here has been painted yellow, a high visible yellow, so uh, for the benefit of all trail users, and then also to sort of get repair it eventually or, you know, eliminate the lip here so that the trip hazard goes away. On the next slide here, on the left, we can see a sidewalk uh, corner or an intersection corner here that was recently reconstructed. Uh, and part of this uh, reconstruction here included the, um, okay. the uh, okay. addition of these tactile plates here just to uh, help those with uh, blind or low vision users sort of identify the uh, the change, uh, the transition from the sidewalk to the roadway in order to help them um, traverse uh, the network safely. And finally, on the right here is an example of some overgrown vegetation, which uh, the tree in the foreground at the top here in the foreground presents sort of a vertical obstruction and sort of there further in the back, you can see that that bush overhanging the network, uh, the trail uh, has uh, taken over about half the width of that trail, which um, can pose both of these events can pose accessibility, accessibility challenges for trail users, and, but these are simply resolved you know, by identifying them and then coming back to education just helps us ensure an accessible facility. Finally, uh, we can see a uh, 
A bench on the you left here is highly accessible. Secure, this bench uh, has been introduced or built on a, uh, a, on a concrete pad to directly just to the trail. And okay. on the left of the bench, you can see that there's a sort of a wider open space. This allows for the easy parking of a, of a wheelchair, for example. And this is, um, these are these little things that sort of help improve the accessibility of the trail and provide, provide the facilities needed to allow everybody to make use. And then finally, on the right here, we can see sort of a edge drop off, um, a little bit of failure of the edge here. Uh, that's not very deep, maybe three, four inches in depth, but uh, again, for any kind of uh, wheeled user, particularly one who may be moving at a higher speed, such as a bicycle, this can result in uh, some sort of catastrophic consequences here. So. Again, identifying these and making repairs in a timely manner are uh, important to uh, ensure that the system is uh, safe and accessible to everybody. So, as we wrap up this presentation, uh, mill maintained trails and bikeways are, uh, are critical, important components of our infrastructure. Maintaining them in good condition leads to increased user satisfaction increased usage. So this is something um, that all agencies should keep in mind. Uh, the implementation of a uh, asset management program for our trails provides uh, similar benefits to those as the one as would implementing a PMS for our roadway networks. We will get the data needed to plan and budget for maintenance and rehabilitation such that our funds are spent, expanded in the most optimal fashion such that our network is maintained in the best condition, which, uh, as I was saying, you know, continues to support uh, trail usage and trail, trail user satisfaction. So it all uh, it all comes together here. And uh, there are new technologies available, technologies, equipment, software that are available on the market to help um, optimize data collection and analysis, all of which uh, feeds into this condition assessment, the massive management uh, principles that we've discussed here in order to um, in order to maintain our networks in the condition that we want them to be. So with that, I will uh, thank you for your attention and turn this over to uh, Dr. Jerry. Okay, next slide, please. So thanks, Mike and Alex. That was uh, pretty exciting. I, I must admit, I'm a skateboard guy myself, not a bicycle guy. Those of you who know me are probably chuckling. Uh, if you haven't already submitted your questions, we encourage you to do so now. Well, we have received a number of questions, which I'll get to momentarily. If you do send a question in, please remember to go to the Q&A button and uh, send it to both the panelists and to the host. Uh, that would help us immensely. What I'd like to do now is very quickly uh, tell you a little bit about the next couple of programs. We've got our 2021 program pretty well lined up. And uh, as you can recall, we provide, as best we can, a diversity in terms of topics. On February 24th, we're going to uh, present uh, a program uh, very differently. It's focused at a program level on transportation research, speak in terms of the value-added success stories and program management to achieve that success, be presented by two of our experts in that area, one from our Wisconsin, office Jason, and then uh, Kevin from our Panama City office in Florida. Our March 24th will become uh, more safety specific related to pavements. And uh, the, the, as you can see from the title, Florida DOT's Enhanced Hydroplaning Prediction Tool. And Mateo from our Orlando, Florida office will be presenting that. We've got a number of programs, as I said, planned uh, beyond these, so stick with us. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, a question uh, that came in uh, that was related to a specific slide, and forgive me, I detest reading things to people, but I will in this case. So this question was submitted, and it's a comment and a question submitted by Riley, and it was submitted shortly after, uh, I believe Mike showed the bike and walk behind data me measurement tools. So cool, this should be standard piece of equipment for every DOT. So two questions, Mike, what is the cost? And also has ARA ever considered investing in a bike pad counters for more dense and urban bikeways? 
Uh, great question. Glad. Uh, thank you for the submittal on that. Um, the uh, to first starting with the bicycle, uh, the the Cook County application that Trek uh, e-bike uh, retails for twenty four ninety nine, and then by the time you can spec it out with the various cameras, uh, a a smartphone, uh, a trailer, or a, uh, I'm sorry, a, a bicycle um, trailer hitch mount uh, carrier to be able to transport the bike from one trail to the next uh, battery pack. There's components. We're talking about uh, in the neighborhood of $5,000 on the door. Uh, the Iowa data bike was a little more expensive. Uh, they chose to use a heavier duty bike. Uh, so the bicycle alone was in the four thousand dollar range and as well. Uh, as far as investing in the ped and bike counters, uh, we're um, we're a consultant, so we kind of do what we're asked to do. We don't maintain that kind of hardware ourselves uh, because we don't necessarily have a consistency for it. But I do believe that more and more trail management uh, agencies are picking up counters uh, in. Uh, and there are several manufacturers and sensors available in the market to uh, actively count the users of their systems so that they can report out not only the uh, use and demand for their systems, but uh, you know, track the hopefully increase in demand associated with various systems. Thanks for your question. Okay, uh, thank you. So uh, another a number of other questions have recently come in. Next one's from Brian, and um, I'm going to let Mike and Alex decide who is best uh, wants to answer these. And the question is, are any of these data collection vehicles motorized, and what is the right quality index used? Mike, I'll field this one. So to answer this question, um, Yes, as an example, uh, the um, the bike used for Cook County was a e assist bike, and um, I think uh, the staff on the who participated in that project found that it was uh, quite beneficial to use a uh, a motorized device uh, or vehicle for this, particularly since uh, it helped uh, maintain speed, which um, helps sort of provide more consistent data when uh, measuring roughness. Uh, on Mississauga project, we used a, uh, a human-powered uh, tricycle. Uh, this worked uh, generally fine for us, but I think uh, you know I think the uh, the inspectors would have definitely enjoyed the experience of riding a, a, a powered powered vehicle just um, as well. In terms of roughness or you know, ride quality index, um, so it all sort of stems from the the accelerometer of the phone is used to develop what's um, What's sort of categorized as an estimated IRI, uh, converting sort of the the up and down uh, motions there into um, applying that to an IRI model. Of course, it's not uh, it's not uh, the same as sort of using a, a, a calibrated uh, inertial profiler, but uh, it is quite comparable. And further to that, we can take these um, these estimated IRIs and convert them to other to other uh, to other indices, uh, in, as an example, for the uh, Canadian project, we ended up reporting a uh, riding comfort index. That's an Ontario specific uh, Ontario specific index, which is also related to IRI, which made that conversion pretty easy. So, uh, depending on what uh, models and what conversions you have available, you can basically spit that out as anything. Okay. okay, thank you. So, um, another question, Azia. I uh, apologize if I mispronounced that. Question is, I know this isn't as relative to um, trail paths, but for multi-use paths, how are paint striping and signage on the ground tracked and maintained? I can take this one as well. Yeah, go ahead, Alex. So, I mean, I, it, there's nothing, uh, there's nothing um, preventing you from doing this. Uh, Multi-use paths, um, trails, even uh, sort of separated, uh, you know, bike bike lanes and stuff can all be maintained in similar fashion. And it's uh, simply a matter of introducing, um, simply inter, uh, you know, introducing this type of field into your data collection methodology. So, um, for example, I mean, this is all pre, uh, 
you know, segment based, it's based on a GIS uh, segment. So basically we could uh, evaluate the uh, pavement marking condition for each of these segments, applying it uh, to whatever kind of score you want to apply, uh, whether it's an excellent, very good, good, fair, poor, or a, uh, you know, a rating out of 10 or something. And then, um, uh, so that'll give you sort of an overall assessment of uh, the pavement marking quality. Uh, for that segment, and if you needed to, if you know if there's some uh, adetic, you know, a, a specific short segment where the marking is sort of worn away completely, you can also uh, in the uh, the R inspector application will make it very easy to sort of identify that location, take a photo of it, and geotag that for future future uh, future reference. So you can uh, report uh, whether you're an agency or a consultant, you can report that, and then take action. Um, as uh, in your maintenance plan to sort of fix the striping there. Okay, um, let me move on to the next question. We've got a few more minutes. We'll try and get in as many questions as possible. Warner asked, how does the bike collector obtain information across the whole three meter wide trail as conditions can vastly uh, differ across the width? And do you make multiple passes? I'll take this one. Um, you know, the it's a great question. It was something that we definitely considered when we were looking at traversing the uh, Cook County trails. Um, that's why we chose to do one pass in each, you know, traditional direction of travel. So we were about an 18 inch or a foot and a half offset from the edge in each direction uh, or on each side of the path so that we could kind of represent like a typical location where most wheels would uh, be traversing path. Um, Alex's experience with Mississauga using a trike is a little bit uh, better suited for a more wide uh, width of, of measurement where you can actually get the axle of the trailer view, uh, and have two different wheels actually uh, representing off the same uh, report in the application. Um, it's there's trade-offs, you know, pros and cons associated with each one. Uh, production levels, I think, are higher on the traditional bicycle. We may get different data out of the trike, and just it, it may be uh, challenging to resolve that too because we've got a combination and potentially different transverse uh, inputs into that uh, application. Sorry. Okay, we, we run out of time for questions, but uh, we do have a number of questions remaining. We have them on record and who they came from, and then our speakers will be responding to those individuals, and we'll do as best we can uh, to address those. Also, I would encourage you, if you ask the question and you have a follow-up, reach out to our speakers. You'll see their uh, web addresses that I'll address at the conclusion of the program. We have uh, just a few more items remaining. Next slide, please. Yeah, uh, sorry about that. I'm, I'm multitasking here. So uh, PTH certificates, I mentioned this at the beginning. Today's presentation is being recorded and a link will be available on the ARA Wednesday webinar website beginning next week. And uh, we received the suggestion from the professional engineering associations that we're only permitted to uh, provide PDH certificates to participants who join for the entire program. A copy of today's presentation in PDH form and your um, in PDF form and your PDH certificate will be available in a couple of weeks. Next slide, please. The ARA is a great company. We're about 1,500 strong, 35 plus offices across the United States and in Canada. We're always interested in great people joining our team. I can attest to that. I'm on my third career, 48th year of practice. That's why you heard Snickers at the skateboarding comment that I made a bit earlier. So stay tuned. Join us next month. We're typically late in the month, third or fourth week, depending on schedules and availability. We thank you for your attention. I want to thank again our speakers for a terrific program. And uh, I think we have one more slide. Perhaps we do not. Uh, those of you who asked questions that we did not get to, we were remiss in not including uh, Mike and Alex's email addresses. We'll make that available when we send the 
PDF file to people. And also, if you have questions as I respond to your questions, you'll obviously have their email addresses. So thanks everyone. Have a blessed day and stay safe.